People with religious OCD spend an incredible amount of time analyzing themselves, analyzing their thoughts, analyzing their spiritual lives, and we make ourselves pretty miserable when we do this. But my question is, what does God think about OCD? What does he think about mental health disorders and the people who are suffering from them? My name is Jamie Eckert, and I share biblical content for Christians who are struggling with OCD and doubt and obsessions and religious weirdness that we can't quite get over in our anxiety disorder. If you have an anxiety disorder, this is a great video for you. If you don't, some of the stuff we talk about might be a little bit wacky for you, but whatever the case, welcome. I hope that something in the video we talk about will help you in your experience with anxiety. spoke with a young man who was just coming out of a three-month stint in a psychiatric hospital. He had been there because of his OCD, although at, the, at that point it was undiagnosed, but he was having just uncontrollable intrusive thoughts, religious intrusive thoughts that were blasphemous and urging him to curse God. He was a devoted Christian. He didn't want to curse God. He loved the Lord, wanted to have a close relationship with him, but he could not get rid of these blasphemous thoughts. And it was driving him absolutely insane. It actually drove him to the point of spending three months in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, and when he spoke with me, he admitted that if he was not on medications, he felt fairly certain that he would have already committed suicide because of these unwanted thoughts. And um, it was just a very, very discouraging situation for this young man because he said, you know, he had tried everything possible to get these thoughts to stop. He couldn't. He could not control his thoughts. And as a Christian, he felt it was his duty to control his thoughts. And so it was, as you can imagine, incredibly guilt-inducing for him to not be able to control those thoughts. And one of the questions that he asked me on the call was, Jamie, why did God make me? If God could foresee the future and he saw that I was going to be this kind of a Christian who could not control my thoughts and that I would have such horrible, awful blasphemous thoughts urging me to curse his name, which in his view was something terrible enough to send him directly to hell. Why would God make me only to be the kind of person that would immediately go to hell? Why? Why would God do that to me? And he admitted to having a lot of confusion in his walk with God, some bitterness and even anger that God had made him like this. As I spoke to him, it just really, for me, brought up that question that some of us, maybe we don't ask it overtly, but for some of us, it might be in the back of our minds. What does God think about us? What does he think about our anxiety, about our OCD, about our anxiety, about the weird thoughts that can go through our minds when we have OCD? Is he really condemning us? Is he just waiting on the edge of his seat to send us to hell as this young man was somehow feeling? Or is there, in God's heart, a tender compassion beyond what any of us could possibly imagine. So I'd like to share with you a passage from scripture that it doesn't answer this question in its entirety, but it does give us one small idea that I think really goes a long way in helping us to find access to his comfort and his peace, even during our times of really, really struggling with OCD's intrusive thoughts. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. I love Psalm 139. The whole chapter is very beautiful, but uh, just from the, the few verses that we read now, I wanna pull out a few practical lessons that I think can, can soothe our hearts, comfort us, and encourage more trust in our loving Lord. Now, the first thing that I notice in this passage is it says that he understands our thoughts as a person with OCD, that is immensely comforting. Because, you know, we spend so much time analyzing our thoughts, trying to figure out, did I mean that thought? Did I want to have that thought? Um, was it an ego dystonic or an ego syntonic thought? And if you are in OCD recovery, you probably know already what those phrases mean. Uh, we, we try to analyze, where did it come from? What do I do now? And a lot of people um, have the feeling that Intrusive thoughts are something very sinful that we need to repent for. That's something we'll talk about in a little bit. But the fact is, God understands our thoughts. He knows them better than we know ourselves. And he knows where they're coming from, so we can trust him. On those days when we can't figure out, did I mean to have that thought? Did I not mean to have that thought? 
we can trust that He already knows. The passage tells us that He understands our thoughts afar off. Why did David bother writing that into his psalm? He could have left that phrase off. What does it mean, He understands my thoughts afar off? Uh, well, as by, by means of illustration, I can tell you that um, as of the time I'm making this video, I've been married for almost 10 years, um, which is not a long time compared to some of you who might be watching this video, but 10 years feels like a long time to me, and it's been um, quite a journey for my husband and I to really know each other and to feel with each other you know, feelings and thoughts and being able to read each other's mind in some way. And um, we can be in a crowded, busy room. We could be at a convention with hundreds of people and I can see him across the hall or across the room um, talking to another person. And I can tell by his body language, by his facial expression, by the energy that he is or isn't putting into that conversation, I can sort of understand what's going on. I can tell, is this a really boring conversation that he's hoping to get out of pretty soon? Is this a very important and intense conversation that I'm gonna hear about later? Um, when you really love someone and you know them deeply, um, you begin to understand them in a way that you can, from afar off, as the psalm says, you can understand them. Now, that's only a very small insight into what this passage means in relationship to God's um, God's view of us because I can't, literally speaking, I can't read my husband's mind. He can't read my mind. I'm sure there's other husbands out there saying, yes, we know, husbands cannot read their wives' minds. <laughs> um, but there's a little bit of insight that you do gain after being married to somebody for a long time. And that far off insight of, you know, the body language, the facial expressions, being able to read into them what they're thinking and feeling, that is just a fraction of God's relationship with us because he can read our minds. He can see into the deepest recesses of our soul and know what we think and feel, why we thought that way, what our motive was. We are so limited in self-understanding and self-awareness. His view of us is perfect. It's unlimited. He knows us and, and, and I think it says afar off just to emphasize the fact that it takes no effort for him. He doesn't have to even like move out of his throne um, to be able to understand us perfectly. From afar off, without any effort, in the blink of an eye, he perfectly knows us and he understands our thoughts. And again, I think this is so encouraging because you and I will have days where we analyze and analyze and try to figure out our thoughts and we just can't do it. We just, can't, we can't, not only do we struggle to control our thoughts, but we really can't always understand the motive behind them. You and I know, if you have OCD, you know that we we can spend hours trying to figure out our thoughts. Normal people don't do that. <laughs> and I think, I think I was a young adult by the time I figured out that other people don't do that. <laughs> um, the point is, God's not stumped. He's not tripped up, he's not confused, he knows exactly what's going on. And the practical application goes like this. After you've been trying to figure your thoughts out unsuccessfully, you can actually just come to God very simply and say, God, I can't figure this out. I don't know, did I mean to have that thought? Did I generate that thought? Was it just a passing sort of temptation? What was that thought? I can't figure it out, Lord. But God, in your word, in Psalm 139, you promised. Your word promises that you understand, Lord. You understand my thought afar off. I know this is not hard for you. For me, this is getting really hard because we're coming on six hours of rumination now. Uh, but God, it's not hard for you. So Lord, will you please, will you please help me? God, if this is just a normal OCD thought, which I think it is, I'm going to do the default OCD thing and I'm going to ignore it. That's like the OCD recovery gold standard. We ignore our thoughts and we just keep on moving. I'm going to do that, Lord, because I think that's the right thing to do. But God, if I'm doing the wrong thing, will you please show me? I, I don't have a guarantee that I'm doing the right thing, but I know that you know, so you can help me. And if this is really a bad and dangerous thought that I need to respond to, please, in some way, show me, Lord. And you can be guaranteed that his word doesn't fail. 
He understands your thoughts and he will come through for you because notice the two things. He understands your thoughts and the Bible says elsewhere, such as in 1 John chapter 4, that God is love. And if God is love, he's not going to be this passive bystander just ignoring you. He is going to come through for you when you need it. So you can trust him. You can pray and leave it in his hands and say, Lord, I'm going to ignore this now. If it's the wrong thing to do, then please fix my mistake and help me. And he'll do that. The last point that I think we can pull from this passage is that because God understands our thoughts, he is not judging us for them. And um, this is one of the big, big issues that we struggle with in dealing with OCD's intrusive thoughts is that we feel like, okay, I just had this thought present itself to my mind, um, which doesn't mean that you thought the thought. It just was a thought, a passing thought. And because that passing thought registered on my mental radar, it must mean that I sinned and I need to repent for that thought. And oh boy, that can easily become a chore. Um, one of the clients that I work with, he, he, he told me about how when he's at work, uh, he works in an office and he has a timer on his phone that um, he, he's constantly having these weird thoughts pass through his mind and then he has to repent for them. But he doesn't want to cheat his employer of his work time. So as he's working, uh, oh, bad thought will come to his mind. Oh no, I can't keep working until I repent for that thought. So he will set the timer on his phone, like the laps, you know, these timer laps. He'll stop and take time out to repent for that thought. Then he'll click the button and keep working again. And by the end of the day, he has so many different laps of time saved up and he needs to re uh, subtract that from his timesheet and make it up on the weekends. Oh, my friends, if you do something like that, I really, really sympathize with you um, because having these um, uncomfortable, intrusive thoughts is bad enough. Feeling like you need to repent for them is incredibly time consuming and annoying. This, um, the young man that I mentioned earlier who um, had spent the last three months in a psychiatric hospital, he was asking me, Jamie, do you think I need to repent for these thoughts? And he was kind of nervous, I think, about my reaction because he said, uh, if I start doing that, if I start repenting for these thoughts, I will be repenting thousands of times per day. <laughs> And uh, I think you can sympathize. You may have, um, you may be doing that yourself, or you may have overcome the, that at this point. Um, but here's here's my thoughts on the on the matter. Um, I have never taken the stance that intrusive thoughts are sinful, um, based on my current biblical understanding and my current understanding of OCD. I may change my mind at some point in the future if I have. Uh, if I encounter better information, but where it stands right now, I would categorize intrusive thoughts sort of in the same category as temptations. It's not that you had the thought. It just was a thought, just a passing thought. Um, e even in moments where you feel like you might have claimed it, or um, sometimes we have something called intrusive emotions where we, we might have a thought and then feel anger towards God or, for, or feel some kind of an urge to to say that thought out loud. Just having an understanding of religious OCD and the way religious OCD works, I still don't classify that as really being a truly egocentric thought, um, simply because when you get out of that panic attack mode and that spiral of anxiety and you get to a sane moment, um, most people are like, no way, I don't want that thought. I didn't mean it, I, I don't agree to it. And um, so in our sane moments, we, we really don't um, believe those, those thoughts. Um, but regardless of the point, uh, or regardless of, of, of the details that we discuss, um, I don't think that intrusive thoughts are sinful and I don't believe they need to be repented from. I think they need to be ignored, like plain and simple. We just need to ignore them, put our, fix our eyes on Christ and just keep moving straight forward. Um, so this question, you know, do I need to, do I need to repent? Do I not need to repent? Uh, I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's really an active issue here. God understands our thoughts and because he understands our thoughts and he knows where they're coming from, he's not condemning us. He is not condemning us for those thoughts. Um, it's interesting if you were to just an illustration here, if you were to break your leg, Let's imagine that you were in a car and you got blindsided by another vehicle and you broke your leg. You went to the hospital, the doctor saw you and he gave you x-rays and uh, they put you together and put a big old cast on your leg and sent you home. You would not be repenting to God or feeling the need to repent to God for your broken leg. 
In fact, you would probably get a lot of attention for it. I've never broken a bone before, but I've seen other people. They get their friends, they sign their name on the cast, and they send flowers and cards, and they say, Oh, I'm so sorry. What happened? Tell me your story. And having a broken leg is an external uh, illness or, or brokenness or health problem that calls forth people's sympathy. It is not something that anybody would say, Oh, you better repent for that broken leg. Um, it's just very natural for us to recognize that there's brokenness in our world. Things happen and um, we need healing, not condemnation. So it's a little bit weird for me that when, you know, if we understand at some level that having a broken leg is okay, it happens, you don't need to apologize to God for it. But yet when there's something in our brain that's broken, all of a sudden that becomes a different story. Some people are like, what do you mean something in my brain is broken? Uh, well, you know, there's the science is still out on OCD. There's still a lot of research being done. There's a lot of things we don't understand fully. Um, but with the brain scans and the brain research that has been done, um, there does seem to be compelling evidence that there is some section of the OCD brain that's not working properly. It fails to give us the full sense of closure that we really want. And that idea of closure is very important because lack of closure is what leads us into repetitive activities. That's what makes people wash their hands repetitively or pray repetitively or check the stove repetitively. Not being able to really feel that we've got finished business, that lack of closure is, is that broken piece. Now, the way we respond to that is very, very important and can make all the difference between you being completely debilitated or you living a normal and healthy life. Um, so definitely the thoughts that we think and the reaction that we have to this little broken piece in our brain is very, very important. Um, the fact that you have some brokenness in, in this organ of your body does not doom you to a life of eternal torment and misery. Um, nevertheless, we do need to recognize that there's something going on in our hardware that needs to be recognized. And if we have some broken hardware upstairs, it just doesn't make sense that you would need to be repenting for that any more than you would need to repent for a broken leg. God understands. And, and I, I just keep coming back to this idea in Psalm 139 that God understands our thoughts afar off. If he does, he's not the one guilt tripping you. Because see, you got those two things again. You have the God is love and God understands. If God is love and God understands, then how can he be unrighteously condemning us? I, I really like, um, I think it's in Genesis 18. I didn't look it up because I wasn't planning on including it in this devotional, but um, you know, when Abraham was dialoguing with God just before God goes to Sodom and Gomorrah, and you remember, you remember that sort of little bartering conversation um, that Abraham had with God. And uh, somewhere in that passage, it says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And I just love that passage, that little, little snippet, because it reminds me that yes, God does judge and he does it perfectly. He does it righteously. Now the person with OCD is biased into thinking that God is a much harsher judge than he actually is. And then you got those folks out there in the free, uh, you know, cheap grace, cheap grace movement, and they think that God is a much lighter judge than he actually is. So there's these, you know, two ends of the spectrum. Um, but whatever worldview that we're coming with, whatever previous biases that we have, we need to recognize that the judge of all the earth will do right. And he will not judge lightly, like too lightly, as the cheap grace proponents would say, but also, He's not gonna judge you one particle more than is necessary. He wants you to live in freedom. He wants you to live in peace and joy. And this idea of walking around all the time with this load of guilt on your shoulders, thinking that you need to repent for thoughts that you can't control and didn't invite, um, I think that that is just uh, probably an incorrect view of God as our merciful judge. Um, and probably could be tempered by more emphasis on uh, what 
sin really is and what God's character is actually like. So I'd like to encourage you today, just with this very short devotional, um, if you've been struggling with your intrusive thoughts, if you've been struggling with OCD in any of its forms and, and wondering what God thinks about you and how he may or may not be judging you in this circumstance, I just wanna encourage you with the words of Psalm 139. Um, and take the time to read the whole passage, the whole chapter when you get a chance. But I wanna encourage you with that chapter to rest and trust in God that he understands your thoughts, um, that you can uh, let go. You can let go of that urge to ruminate for hours and hours on end and just trust that he's got you. God loves you very much. He judges righteously and he's able to understand your thoughts perfectly and make decisions based on that. So even on days when you can't figure it out, trust him, ask him, say, God, I can't figure this out, but I know you can. And try your best to just ignore these thoughts. Put your focus on Christ, on practical duties of everyday life, and just keep going forward. Try to get out of your head and go forward. And I believe as you do this, trusting in God, it's gonna get easier and easier to make this a habit. So thank you so much for joining today for the devotional. I hope in some way it's been a blessing to you, and I look forward to seeing you back next week.